Credit where credit is due. For all the bad that's happening in 2020, it's been a very exciting year for Overwatch, as far as balancing is concerned. I mean, the one thing that new content and Overwatch 2 have in common so far is the fact that they're non-existent. It's been a year since they announced the sequel and hereby declared that updates for the original game would be minimal, but we haven't gotten as much as a pinky toe worth of information. Anyway, we take what we can get and these balance updates are actually pretty dope. Considering the fact that buffs and nerfs would usually come in intervals of 6 months, months? That's quite something. And I mean, we're talking about Widowmaker of all heroes. There are few characters that impact players' ability to enjoy the game as much as her. On the one side, she gives credit to Blizzard's claim of Overwatch being an actual FPS. But on the other side, who enjoys getting one shot across the map? Now, of course, her ability to do so has not been impacted at all, but a lot of people always said that Blizzard's design philosophy around snipers has been really weird. In a game built around counterplay, you shouldn't remove characters' weaknesses more than you should accentuate their strengths. For for Hanzo, Ash, and Widowmaker to have such reliable means of combating their counters in close range made them a pain in the butt to fight, particularly when involving pocket mercies. Listen, I'm perfectly fine with people who have insane aim to still be able to pop off on Widowmaker, and as much as I can produce some highlight-worthy clips after a few days of practice, it always bothers me when an average Andy like me can just hop onto a hero and start getting insane value without even having mastered them. So can I still get away with being a body shot bandit, or did Jeff and the Overwatch team successfully raise Widowmaker's skill floor. After all, the plethora of flanking DPS heroes are gonna have a much easier time taking her out now as soon as they can close the distance. In that regard, Widowmaker and Zenyatta aren't actually all that different. And a lot of you guys always ask me, Cliff, how do you defend yourself against heroes like Sombra? Well, let me tell you, dear viewer, I achieved that with the power of today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark helps you protect your identity and credit card info so that pesky hackers like Sombra can't get their hands on them. Not only does Surfshark have over 1800 servers and 63 countries, but their clean web feature automatically blocks more than 1 million known malicious websites, phishing methods, and other threats. Try to get past that one, Sombra. Surfshark VPN allows you to make the internet believe that you're from another country, not only to fool the red team, but also to bypass geo restrictions to access content that would otherwise be unavailable to you. Wait a second, what? New content? That's right! Content libraries on platforms like Netflix vary depending on where you are from, but with the help of Surfshark VPN, you can get access to all of them on all of your devices. And let's face it, if there's one community on this planet that knows all about recycled content, it's the Overwatch community. The only thing that could make getting to access new content while also protecting your online privacy even better is saving money. And guess what? I got you covered with that one as well. You can get Surfshark VPN 83% off and get 3 extra months for free simply by visiting the link in the top line of the description and enter promo code Cliff Terios. It's, it's my name. My name is the promo code. It's almost like you're losing money by not clicking the link in the description below. Thanks a lot to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's video and now onto our standard programming. Now we have already covered a few episodes ago that the best training ground to test your DPS skills is on the King of the Hill format. Since these maps are really just death matches in disguise, DPS players really get to flex their muscles and I on the other hand have to prove that I can keep up with them. Ilios Well would be my first proving ground, meaning I had to show what I was made of under suboptimal circumstances while hoping that the next round would take us to ruins. The enemy team was featuring more flankers than I anticipated with the enemy Genji immediately looking to mess me up. With a slight hint of panic I took to the skies to avoid his anime rage and more than that, even managed to take him out. But before I could even begin feeling smug about that play, I found myself eliminated by their second flanker, who then proceeded to also eliminate my Moira. The rest of my team didn't realize what was happening in our backline as they boldly moved towards the enemy spawn until it was too late. Thankfully, we had done enough damage to win the first fight and thus secure the initial cap, but at that point, I already knew that this was bound to be a difficult match for me. The enemy tracer was still alive running circles around my team, but Jeff would grant me the sweet taste of revenge as I spotted her blinking into my my direct line of sight. Meanwhile on the front line, my Echo, whose name I'm embarrassed to admit took me way too long to realize that was Genji backwards, dive bombed the opposing Genji for a quick and easy elimination. One that would be immediately resurrected, albeit in my direct line of sight. I wouldn't miss out on an opportunity to boost my critical hit statistic by firing into a stationary target, though once I had acquired that elimination, the enemy Hammond decided to turn this round of Overwatch into a survival game for me. Thankfully, I have unhealthy amounts of experience in that genre of game. I swiftly escaped onto the enemy high ground and hoped 
hopes of finding protection with my Lucio and the enemy bull had no choice but to retreat. But there was more than just one fight currently taking place. The two Roadhogs tried to hook each other off the map just for our Lucio to take the glory instead. Assuming they could turn the tides in their favor, Falcon tried to get a multi-kill with their sticky bomb and well, I mean they did kill two players, it's just unfortunate that they were one of them. While I was in our backline freaking out about the slightest bit of poke damage coming my way, our echo was just kind of leisurely hanging out in the sky, hunting down eliminations with no care in the world and frankly speaking, kind of putting the rest of us on their back. Though all of that carrying would not stop Falcon from redirecting their attention and making it their mission to hunt me down once again. My health pool got decimated so quickly that even a grappling hook couldn't save me anymore. But it was obvious at that point that my team wasn't happy about the enemies just running into our backline and that Tracer specifically was getting away with murder way too often. I didn't realize it at the time of playing, but seeing in the replay that my Hammond and Lucio tried really hard to avenge my death gives me a newfound appreciation for this team. And as much as that kind of behavior was oozing Giga Chad energy, unfortunately it was not oozing point presence energy. And as such, the blue team could easily overrun whoever was left to defend it for an easy backup. Now if there's one thing I have in spades as a Zenyatta player, it's game sense. I realize that if we are to win this game, it's not going to be on the back of my aim. But that doesn't mean that I can't play the recon assist. My ultimate would reveal the enemy team's exact location, which allowed my Lucia to not only find a target, but also the perfect time to engage in order to get an environmental. My Rotog also made use of the additional intel by rushing into the opposing brigade to take her out and allow the rest of our team entry to the capture point. The blue team was so concerned with playing around sniper sightlines that they didn't at all pay attention to my Echo, who was coming in hot from the skybox to delete their Baptiste off the map. It was kind of amazing to see what my team was able to do on the back of me doing nothing but press Q and exist. You can tell that the fear of Widowmaker still affects players' positioning unlike any other threat in the game. By the end of this round, I found myself having done very little in the damage department and more so simply created the perception of a threat that needs to be played around. If I can keep that ruse up into the next map, maybe we can actually win this game. But obviously, I didn't want to end this match without having clicked any heads. We may have won the first map, but I can't say that I was exactly pleased with my performance. Don't be mistaken, the HP nerf makes a big difference. Much like Widowmaker creates fear that affects the enemy team's positioning, the threat of being dove did the same to me. Unfortunately, I would not be granted the benefit of running Widowmaker on Ilio's ruins, now having to find a way to make her work on Lighthouse instead. I'm sure seasoned Widowmaker players would have much less of an issue with the specific maps than me, but that's kind of the point. I want to find out if any monkey on a controller can get value out of Widowmaker like I have already proven what's the case with Echo. Falcon was very determined to make this difficult for me, now having switched to a Doomfist. Well knowing where hitscan heroes want to position themselves, they went through the effort of setting up a rollout to smash me to bits, but I was already gone. Rewinding just a little bit will show a novice Widowmaker getting attacked by a Genji, and as much as I had my escape route all figured out, with a Venom Mine and everything, I was unfortunate enough to meet the opposing Roadhog on my way to the Mega Health Pack, which naturally didn't bode well for my chances of survival. Our tanks were the only ones that actually made it to the capture point, but sheer tenacity can keep you alive only for so long. The objective was in the hands of the blue team and now more than ever, I felt like I was a big handicap to my team. Considering my range advantage and the fact that I was the first to bite the dust, I respawned soon enough to try and lay down suppressive fire. But more than suppression, my tanks could have really used some more bonafide devastation. Once again, all I achieved was to affect the enemy team's positioning without producing any results on the back of it. Although an opening pick on the enemy Genji wasn't a bad start, I immediately felt myself dove by Falcon once again. But you see, my teammates were such absolute giga chats that even if I barely landed any shots, they could make use of the fact that the enemy team really wanted to get rid of me. And that's where our comeback began. Because once both the enemy DPS were taken care of, there was nothing that could stop our Echo from tearing through the enemy team with their skill beam. Well, except for the enemy McCree coming back from spawn. I found it weird at first that the Genji would switch to a McCree even though he still had a Dragon Blade, but I suppose he realized that I wasn't really doing anything while our Echo definitely needed to be taken care of. Speaking of taking care of things, that same McCree had absolutely no shame and rather than trying to impress with a public display of hit scan prowess, he sent our Winston back to the spawn with a legendary triple fan the hammer. Losing our main tank definitely put us on the back foot, but at that point we all knew who the weak link on the enemy team was. If we can keep their DPS on the respawn train, then surely we'd be able to hang onto the objective. And to achieve that, there was no ultimate too valuable, causing Ozaria to blow her graviton search in order to keep their doomfist at bay. Things started to get really crazy when everybody decided that now was the time to smash their Q buttons with reckless abandon just to 
be able to finally take the fight to the point where I would have no direct line of sight. And they would be right. All I could do was be patient and hope for somebody to get pushed out of cover, which granted did allow me to pick up an elimination, but Falcon wasn't done harassing me yet. Honestly, I completely lost sight of them after my grapple and I just kind of assumed they would try to contest the objective, which is the exact mistake that led to my elimination. But that crime obviously didn't go unnoticed with my entire team turning around to avenge my death. But credit where credit is due, after a successful assassination, Falcon retreated to a health pack rather than full sending it into my team. With me back in spawn, the position affecting threat of a Widowmaker was gone, and what made it even worse was the fact that their McCree just suddenly decided to absolutely pop off and eliminate core members of our team. The dive bomb came in too late to save anyone, and since so many of us had perished at that point, we'd have to go back to the drawing board. The only saving grace was the fact that Falcon tried to chase our Lucio down, which not only led to his demise, but also what I can only assume was a very satisfying teabag for Fabi. We were one team fight away from taking this map, and subsequently, the victory for this match. Their Doomfist having fed his brains out meant that we had a brief window of opportunity in which we could really push our advantage to try and end this game once and for all. And that's not something that you have to tell my team twice, our main tank immediately jumped onto the point with unparalleled confidence to show the enemies that we didn't even need to be on Ilya's ruins to take this W. Winston had successfully forced the opposition to contest him on the objective, allowing our team to send the cavalry in to drive home the fact that our monkey was never meant to be a sacrifice, but instead, this spear that leads our forces. None of us had any reservations when it came to the usage of our ultimates because rather than worrying about the next team fight, we were here to ensure that there would be no next team fight. The enemy team made a valiant effort to try and stall out the objective long enough to get some of their own crucial ultimates online, but at the end, only one team could prevail, and that team was us. I suppose there are some things that are just never going to change. So long that Widowmaker has the ability to one-shot her enemies across the map, she is and always will be a threat that needs to be played around. But I can definitely tell you, based on my attempts of playing her after the nerf, that off-pick body shot bandits aren't gonna have it quite as easy anymore. You die really, really quickly against any flanker with even a moderate amount of skill, meaning it's do or die when it comes to your aim as well as your positioning, depending on the map, of course. It really feels like she's exclusively a high rank problem now, and might not annoy me quite as much in my casual matches anymore. But how do you feel about the most recent patch? A lot of heroes have been tweaked, and I'm definitely planning to take a look at all of them. But for the time being, thank you everybody so much for watching today's episode of Stories in Overwatch. If you enjoyed what you have seen, then let me know by dropping me a like on your way out, consider subscribing if you want to see more, and definitely hit that bell icon to not miss out on my next upload. Thanks again to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's video, and I hope to see you all next time. Peace.